In this episode, let's measure the light output from this 1064 nanometer laser head from two trees and convert infrared laser light into green laser light with a nonlinear crystal. In a previous episode, I reviewed the Two Trees TS2 laser engraver. The reason I was so interested in doing this was because it came with this 1064 nanometer laser module. According to the manufacturer's website, this has two watts of average power, which doesn't seem like a lot. However, its peak power is a whopping 15 kilowatts, which is why it's so capable of engraving things like metal. If this is true, then for the price, it changes everything when it comes to experiments in micro machining and nonlinear optics. This is very much unlike the regular laser diodes that you might have come across for laser engraving. This is actually a diode pumped solid state Q switched laser, which is quite a mouthful. Um, I'm sort of loath to tear this down at this point. So what I've done here is I've created a diagram so that we can see how this thing works. So let's take a look at that. I've put together a diagram here based on the specifications from the manufacturer's website. On the left hand side, we can see we've got a laser diode that's rated at 8 watts at 808 nanometers, and this is our pump diode. And then on the right, we've got the solid state laser cavity itself. Uh, to the left of it, we've got a high reflector, which uh, reflects about 100% of 1064 nanometer light and actually transmits the 808 nanometer light from the laser diode. On the right, we've got our output coupler, which is probably about 50% um, transmission or thereabouts. In the middle, we've got our neodymium YAG rod, which is our lasing material. And then to the right of it, we've got a chromium YAG saturable absorber. When the laser diode is switched on, the light actually passes through the rear mirror and into the neodymium YAG rod. This optically pumps the medium, which is to say it raises those neodymium atoms to a higher energy state. Eventually, some neodymium atoms might begin to release 1064 nanometer light by fluorescence. However, the laser is actually blocked from oscillating by the chromium YAG saturable absorber, which is, for all intents and purposes, spoiling the cue of the laser cavity. At a sufficiently high light intensity, however, the ground state of those chromium atoms in the saturable absorber material is excited to an upper energy state, which effectively renders it very suddenly transparent, allowing the laser to oscillate. This sudden Q switching of the laser cavity allows the very fast release of the stored energy in the form of a short duration, extremely high powered pulse. Once the pulse has been emitted, the neodymium atoms in the neodymium YAG rod are repopulated by the pump laser diode and the process repeats over and over and over. So a continuous train of high powered pulses is emitted. I suppose the mechanism is analogous to the relaxation oscillator that you might be familiar with in electronics. When we're measuring a pulse solid state laser like this, there are a few things we have to bear in mind. The first and foremost is obviously safety. And to that end, the very first job that I've done with this laser is to build an aluminium plate for it. This is actually bolted onto the bottom of the laser module so I can bolt it to an optical bench. That way I have a nice stable setup where the laser can't possibly move around. You know, if you accidentally knock it or anything like that, um, it'll stay you know, firmly affixed to the bench. You don't want a situation with class four lasers where you've got an unpredictable beam, right? So you need to make th sure that things are predictable. On the right hand side here, I've got a beam block which will capture uh, most of the beam should, should an error occur during measurement. And I also have the all important laser safety glasses. It should be noted that two trees don't actually supply these. These are my own. I think that manufacturers should be supplying appropriate laser safety eyewear. Uh, but yeah, these are optical density nine at 1064 nanometers. They're certified and they will do a perfect job of protecting my vision. Uh, at the front here, we've got three sensors. The one on the left hand side is an infrared detector card and the idea behind this is you can wave it in front of the infrared beam which is invisible and it will actually show up as a sort of orangey yellow spot uh, so you can line the beam up with whatever sensors you've got going on. You can use this with the laser safety glasses as well, it works perfectly fine. I've got two sensors here. The one on the right is a photodiode from Thor Labs. This is a fast photodiode. If memory serves, the rise time is on the order of about 35 picoseconds or so. And we can use this to measure the pulse width of the laser output itself. In order to measure the pulse energy, I have a separate sensor here. This is a dual meter from Gentech Electro Optics. And what this does is it's a little pyroelectric sensor. And every time the, uh, the beam strikes the surface of this, it generates a very, very tiny amount of heat, which is translated into voltage. And you can hook this up to an oscilloscope actually and read off the voltage right away, do a quick calculation, a simple division, uh, and work out how many microjoules or millijoules there are in each shot. I'll just show you this sensor. It's very, very compact. It's built into a BNC plug. And there's the surface of the sensor itself. Um, excellent. 
So yeah, we've got these two sensors because this doesn't measure in the time domain at all. It just gives us a peak voltage out, which is directly proportional to the energy. Um, this doesn't measure the energy, but it does measure the pulse width. So this measures in the time domain. Anyway, let's, uh, let's do a time domain measurement first. I'll get this thing set up and we'll take a look at the oscilloscope and see what we've got. So hopefully you can hear me above the fan noise of the laser module here. I have the photodiode itself mounted some distance beyond the focal point of the laser. So this thing actually has a lens built into it that focuses the, the uh, laser to a point about an inch or so in front of it. And if I take a copper coin here and hold it in the beam path, we'll see eventually a little flash as the laser starts removing the oxide layer. There it is. Excellent. Uh, so obviously we don't want to damage the sensor, so I've got it mounted another inch away from the focal point itself. Let's have a look at the output on the oscilloscope and see what we can see. So we'll just take a quick look on the oscilloscope at these signals. I've got two traces on here. The top trace is our PWM signal to the laser module itself, and the bottom trace is our optical output. Uh, currently, I've got the PWM signal turned all the way down, but if I turn it up, we can see our optical pulses out. So now we have a, an input pulse width of about, uh, I don't know, 100 microseconds or so. And for that, we're getting three optical pulses out of the front of the laser. Obviously, if I increase the pulse width, we'll get many, many more of these. So I'll just turn it up a little bit more. And we can see our repetitive pulses out of the front of this uh, diode pump solid state laser. Very, very nice indeed. If I zoom in a little bit, we can take a quick measurement of the distance between these pulses. It looks to me to be on the order of about 30 microseconds or so. Uh, so it looks like the pulse repetition frequency, like the free running uh, frequency of the laser is around about uh, 30, 33 kilohertz, uh, something of that ilk. So I'm zoomed in on the optical signal itself here so we can take a close look at it and perform a measurement. And the pulse width, you know, full width half maximum seems to be around about five nanoseconds. Uh, so there we have it. We've got an actual measurement of the pulse width of the laser module. Excellent. I have the pyroelectric sensor mounted in front of the laser here. I've had to actually get it really quite close to the focal point. Uh, obviously not right on it, otherwise it'll blow the coating off the sensor. Uh, but yeah, reasonably close in order to get the full beam to couple into the end of the sensor there. If we take a look at the output on the oscilloscope here, we can see that we have a peak that's about 12 millivolts in height, and from that we can derive the laser pulse energy. Now that the values have been recorded from the sensors, we can do a little bit of maths on them, or we can use a handy calculator like this one. This is a calculator I came up with a couple of years ago to compute uh, nitrogen laser output powers, but pulse lasers are pulse lasers. So we can just go ahead and fill in our values. So we read 12 millivolts peak from the pyroelectric sensor, and we had a pulse width of approximately five nanoseconds and our repetition rate here was 30 kilohertz. So we'll hit calculate and there's all our figures. So we've got an energy output here of 89 odd microjoules per pulse. Well, our peak power is above the rated specification of 15 kilowatts. We're actually at almost 18 kilowatts per pulse. So that's very, very nice indeed. And our average power uh, once again is a little bit over spec. The quoted power was two watts. And we've got an average power here, you know, assuming that we run at 100% uh, duty cycle of about 2.7 watts. Uh, very, very nice indeed. In order to use the laser on the optical bench, it's kind of convenient to have a nice tight collimated beam. The beam from the laser itself actually uh, has a lens in front of it that's mounted into the head and it appears to be glued in there. It's quite difficult to remove. I've managed to get it to turn a couple of times, but I'm afraid to remove it in case I actually damage something. And the purpose of this lens uh, for engraving is to focus it to a focal point around about an inch away from the head. So I've built an external collimator here that gives me a nice tight collimated infrared beam that travels right the way across the bench. Obviously we can't see this in the camera because it's infrared, it's completely invisible, but if we take the infrared detector card and place it in the beam path, we can actually see the spot that that produces. So we've got a very, very nice tightly collimated beam there. Excellent. In the beam path, I've actually mounted a short focal length lens. And if I take an old copper penny and hold it in the beam path, uh, find the focal point, we'll see a couple of flashes off of the surface of that as we begin to remove the oxide layer. Absolutely fantastic. 
If you're familiar with green laser pointers, you might well be aware that internally, a green laser pointer actually contains an infrared laser, uh, a laser that lasers at 1064 nanometers. And that beam is actually passed through a very, very tiny nonlinear optical crystal inside here that actually doubles the frequency of the beam and gives us green light out at 532 nanometers. There's a wonderful explanation here on Wikipedia with some very, very nice diagrams that people have uh, contributed. There's actually uh, two explanations for this, um, given the wave particle duality of light, um, you can pick your poison. So on the one hand, we've got the quantum explanation where we've got two high energy, uh, two low energy 1064 nanometer photons go in, uh, they're destroyed, and a fo single photon is released with twice the energy of your input photon. On the other hand, we've got the wave explanation. Um, this one I actually like much better. Um, I, I mean, behind both of these is a screed of maths, right? But if we're trying to conceptualize or visualize a process, uh, I like this, this far more. Um, yeah, basically when, when a, uh, a, well, a, a light wave um, is comprised of an electric and a magnetic field at 90 degrees to one, to one another, right? And as that electric field propagates through a transparent material, it can cause um, the electron shells around atoms to oscillate. Basically a bunch of oscillators, right? And it's possible to get oscillators to oscillate at uh, harmonics. Um, rather than the fundamental and these can actually be uh, linked or coupled back into the wave that's propagating through the material and give us green light out. Um, again, you know, you can find this out in the comments down below. I mean, <laughs> which is the best explanation of particle or a wave for this kind of stuff. Anyway, let's set up an experiment to see this occur from a practical standpoint. Uh, to that end, I thought it would be a really cool demonstration to go out onto AliExpress and actually buy one of these nonlinear optical crystals. This is a potassium titanyl phosphate crystal. Uh, it's the same crystal that's used in green laser pointers. And at the peak powers that we're getting out of this laser here, if we simply place this crystal in the beam path, uh, we'll have infrared light going in and green light emerging from the other side. So let's see this. I've mounted on the bench here my nonlinear crystal. It's on a post which is attached to a rotation stage. Uh, currently the laser's off, so nothing very much exciting is happening. But the reason it's on a rotation stage is so that I can vary the angle of the crystal with respect to the laser beam to get maximum green light output. Um, effectively, we're lining up the crystal lattice with the electromagnetic wave itself from the laser. Uh, this is a process known as phase matching. Anyway, let's turn this laser on and see what happens. And just like that, we've got a brilliant green beam emerging out of this crystal. Uh, to prove that this is actually coming from the crystal and it's not a beam coming this way across the bench, I can block off the infrared beam with this infrared detector card and the beam will cease. Absolutely fantastic. Very, very nice. Um, this is a sight to behold, it has to be said. Second harmonic generation. Beautiful. This should be ideal for pumping things like small dye lasers and perhaps even photonic crystal fiber in a super continuum laser setup. Now it is entirely possible to get second harmonic generation to occur in your hand. Now I would absolutely not recommend that anybody tries this, uh, but I've got my nonlinear crystal here in between my finger and thumb. And if I place it into the beam path and tilt it, we should be able to get a phase matching condition and get brilliant green light emerging from the crystal. Very, very nice. Not quite as good as with the mount, but certainly possible. Thanks for watching this episode of Les's Lab. If you want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit like and subscribe down below, and I'll see you guys next time.